Hello everyone. In this video, I will be describing you about determination of charge on a polypeptide. Before actually understanding how we can determine the charge of a polypeptide by simple five step method, let me inform you about the prerequisites of this method. So we should remember few things that a polypeptide is made up of several amino acids and every amino acid is joined together by a peptidal linkage which is also called as amide linkage in which carboxy group of one of the amino acid interacts or condenses with the amino group of another amino acid. So when we write a polypeptide we can write generally as a sequence of amino acids and as a convention it is always written from N terminal to C terminal. That means first amino acid will have amino group represented on the left hand side and the last amino acid of the chain will have carboxy group represented on right hand side. We should also know that every amino acid can be represented by a single letter code and as we know that there are uh, 20 standard amino acids and there are 26 letters in the English alphabet so there are six English alphabets which are not assigned to standard amino acids and these letters are B, J, O, U, X and Z. So any sequence of English alphabet letters which do not contain these six mentioned letters can be considered as a potential peptide. However, when we go for the detailed notations, we would realize that these six letters have also been assigned to some other things, but they are not required at this point of time. Next requirement for determining charge is to understand that when several amino acids join together to form a polypeptide, their amino group and carboxy groups are generally condensed except for the terminal amino acids in which the first amino acid will have free amino group and the last amino acid will have free carboxy group. Whereas the charge of a peptide will be mainly decided by side chains which are hanging around from these amino acids. And as amino and carboxy group are condensed and they involve in peptide bond formation, so amino acids in a peptide are often referred to as residues. So considering these prerequisites, the first peptide is always written from N terminal to C terminal. Amino acids can be represented by single letter code except for six letters. Then charge of a peptide is mainly decided by its carboxy terminal residue, its amino terminal residue and the charge on side chains. So these are the few uh, basic information which is required which are required for determination of charge. Now let us move into a very simple five step method to determine charge of a peptide. So step number one. First, write down the complete sequence of a peptide in single letter notation from N terminal to C terminal. As it has been shown in the example, I have written my own name which can be a potential peptide. You can see the letters A, D, I, T, Y, A, A, R, Y, A. They are representing different amino acids and as we can see, the first amino acid alanine is representing its N terminal and the last letter again alanine is representing C terminal of this peptide. Now step number two. In this step, we have to un encircle all the residues which might have charged side chains. So we should know the fact from biochemistry that out of 20 standard amino acids, there are two amino acids which can have acidic side chains and they are considered to have be called as acidic residues. They are glutamate and aspartate represented by letters D and E. Then we have three different residues which have basic nature. They are represented by letters H, R and K which are histidine, arginine and lysine. And besides these five amino acids, two more amino acids, one is tyrosine represented by letter Y and another one is cysteine represented by letter C can also have ionization in their side chains. So basically we are going to encircle those 5 plus 2, 7 different letters wherever we find in the peptide sequence. So keep a note of letters. You have to check D, E, H, R, K, C and Y and encircle them in the second step of charge determination.
Now third step. In this step, we have to represent all the possible charged state of N terminal and C terminal and all the side chains. So we know that aspartate can have a side chain which may be represented as COO minus or COOH. Similarly, glutamate can also have similar side chains. Histidine can have side chains as NH2 plus or NH2 uh, NH. Arginine and lysine can have side chains as NH3 plus or NH2. And uh, cysteine can have side chains as SH or S minus. Tyrosine can have side chains in the form of OH or O minus. Apart from the side chain designations, we will also provide the charged state, all the possible charged state of N terminal residue and C terminal residue. So we represent N terminal amino terminal residue by depicting NH3 plus or NH2 states. And at the carboxy terminal, we mark COO minus and COOH. This, so this was the third step in which we have depicted all the possibilities of charged state for encircled residues. Now the fourth step. This is a critical step for determining the charge. Here we have to rule out one of these two possibilities. As we have seen in, in the given example that in the given peptide we have encircled all charge possibilities and written all of them. But now out of these two possibilities written at all the places, one of the possibility is going to be correct and another is wrong. But this will be decided by the pH and the prevailing conditions in the solution. So how do we determine which one is correct and which one is wrong? There is a very simple logic. The protonation and deprotonation of any group is decided by prevailing pH and the existing pKa values. So we might have to first look at the given pH in the or, or the given condition and then at the second condition, second step, we might have to look at the pKa or pKr values of the side chains. As a simple rule, we should know that if pH exceeds the pKr values, there is going to be deprotonation. If pH is less than the pKr values, the state is going to be protonated. So this basic logic will help us to find out whether there will be a protonated state for a given condition or given uh, molecule. So for, uh, for a given molecule or a given group, we will check that whether it is, a protonated, it is in protonated form or it is in deprotonated form. So in the fourth step, our idea was to determine the exact charge state. And we have used a simple logic that if pH of a given solution or a given condition exceeds the pKr value, the functional group will be in deprotonated state. And if the pH is lower than the given value, then the functional group will be in protonated state. But we should remember that protonated or deprotonated state might have different charge depending on the kind of group. Like if carboxy group is protonated, it will be neutral with no charge. And if amino group is protonated, it will have plus one charge. On the other hand, if carboxy group is deprotonated, it will have minus one charge. And if amino group is deprotonated, it will be neutral in charge. Now it is important to have pKr values known to determine the exact charge state of a particular molecule and also pKa1 value for the carboxy terminal and pKa2 value for the amino terminal charge determination. So there is a simple way to remember all these things. However, these values can be found in almost every biochemistry textbook. pKa values of all the carboxy terminals for most of the amino acids are between 2.2 plus minus 0.5 and pK2 values for the amino terminal of any amino acids are around 9.4 plus minus 1.5. So this trick can be utilized to determine that what is exact pKa values of the carboxy terminal and amino terminal. On the other hand, if you, if, if you want to recall or if you want to have a memory trick or a memory aid for side chains, then pKr values can be represented by a simple mnemonic or a simple memory trick, Delhi centric Q Rehna, that is D-E-H-C-K-Y-R. As you can see in the image, these are the residues which have ascending pKr values. The first one, D, aspartate has 3.65, E has 4.25, H has 6.0, C has 8.18, 
then K which is lysine has 10.53 Y tyrosine has 10.07 and arginine has PKR of 12.48. Now based on this fact that what is given pH and what are the PKA or PKR values of residues we are now going to rule out one of the two possibilities that we have determined in the last step. So now we will look at each and specific position. Let's start with the amino terminal of alanine. So the pKa value or pKa2 value of alanine is around 9.4 and therefore at the pH 7 this will be protonated because pH is less than pKr value and therefore it will remain protonated in an H3 plus form. So NH2 form which is uncharged is ruled out, it is wrong at this place and NH3 plus is correct. Now we move to the last part or carboxy terminal and as we know that the pKa1 value of alanine is around 2.2 and our pH is 7 so we will consider that this will be in the deprotonated state at this point as pH is exceeding the pKa value so we cross the COOH form and we consider COO minus form here. Now in this given peptide we have D, Y, R and Y as charged as dues which we have already encircled in step number 2. So each of these have two possibilities. Now again we will use the same rule. We will look at the pH and pKr value and then we will determine which state is correct. So for the first one D aspartate we know that the pKr value for aspartate is 3.65 and the pH is 7 so pH is greater than pKr that means the condition will be deprotonated and therefore COO- will be considered correct and COOH will be considered wrong. For tyrosine pKr is 10.07 therefore we will consider the, deprotonate, the, the protonated form as correct because pH is 7 that is less than pKr value so OH is correct O- is wrong. Again for arginine we have the side chain PKR value as 12.48 and pH given pH is 7. So pH is less than PKR. Therefore, again, we will consider the protonated form as correct. So NH3 plus form is correct here, NH2 is wrong. And then again for tyrosine, as we have stated earlier, that protonated form or OH will be correct, O minus will be wrong. So this is how in this step, step number five, we have ticked out or we have ruled out one of the wrong possibilities of charge state and chosen the correct possibility at the given pH. And the final step is just to add all the charges. So let's again calculate this charge or compute this charge and we add all the charge values. So if you add all these values starting from the N terminal to C terminal, as we can see here, the first position has plus one charge, D has zero charge, Y has zero charge, R has plus one charge, Y has zero charge and finally A has negative charge. So on adding all these values we finally get zero. And this is how we came to a conclusion that the given peptide sequence at pH 7 will have zero charge. So this is a common six step procedure which can be followed anytime and you can practice plenty of question by simply writing your name and if you have letters like B, J, O, U, X or Z which do not encode for standard amino acids, you can eliminate them and you can practice a number of time this basic strategy to determine the charge at any given pH. But remember, we will be requiring pKa1 values, pKa2 values, pKr values of charged residues and also we need to know the given pH of the condition. This method is only applicable for the short peptides, those peptides which are very large, there are computational methods and computational tools available for finding out the charge of a peptide. Thank you.